Welcome to Bryan College Online. Today we're looking at Jesus as the new Elijah slash Elijah. And what we'll look at are two stories, one not well known, the widow's son at Nain, Luke 7, and then the feeding of the 5,000, the only miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels other than the resurrection. Both these miracles are connecting Jesus with the Elijah, Elisha stories. So let's look at that. In the Old Testament, Elijah is the first big prophet. Um, he does a number of miracles and he's followed by Elisha. And Elisha does some of the same miracles, but only better multiplying oil, applying lots of oil, raising a widow's son with difficulty, raising a Shunammite's son with less difficulty. This is part of a theme of pairs in the Bible. So Moses can't get people in the promised land. Joshua brings the people into the land. And we've seen that the word Jesus and the word Joshua are the exact same word in Greek, so there's a connection there. Jesus is the new Joshua. The law can't get you in. The new Joshua can get you in. Elijah and Elisha come along. Uh, where Moses uh, died is the same where, uh, same exact place where Elijah is taken into heaven, and he's followed by Elisha, who crosses the Jordan just like Joshua crossed the Jordan after. Um, uh, Moses died. And then John the Baptist, who dresses in the same garb as Elijah, gives way to Jesus, who's the ultimate Joshua, the ultimate Elisha, the ultimate uh, everything. He's the new M Moses. He's fulfilling all of it. So this is part of the theme of Jesus as the perfect prophet, priest, and king all rolled into one. He's the new Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and everything else too. When we come to this story, this is the story of the widow at Zarephath and the multiplication of oil. So he does this uh, miracle where they can eat. They have very little, but they end up, uh, the three of them surviving the famine. And we read this story in 1 Kings 17. Uh, the oil doesn't run out. Uh, the flour doesn't run out until the famine is over. When we come to Elijah and Elijah as Elisha 2.0, we have a very similar story, only now it's a wife of a prophet who's destitute and Elisha tells her to go get lots of um, uh, containers and uh, miraculously the oil fills all the containers and they're able to sell that oil and live on the rest. So it's a slightly greater miracle um, that Elisha does than Elijah. Part of this idea of Elisha being the Elijah 2.0 so in the Old Testament, you were kind of geared to think that way. Uh, Moses gives way to Joshua. Elisha, Elijah gives way to Elisha. Now, there's a story about both those prophets, Elijah and Elisha, raising someone from the dead. And in both those stories, there are some similar themes. Uh, there's a room that is built for the prophet. Uh, when the child dies, the child is placed in that room. Uh, oddly, the prophets lay on the child before um, uh, he's raised from the dead. And both prophets pray desperately for God to act. And so when we come to the Elijah story, uh, this uh, widow at Zarephath, her son is raised. Um, the woman kind of chides uh, Elijah, uh, did you come here to remind me of my sin? Uh, why did you cause the death of my son? Uh, the prophet takes her 
uh, him from her arms, carries him up to the upper room, uh, lays him down, um, lays on the child uh, three times, prays three times, and then the child's raised from the dead. So it's an incredible uh, miracle of Elijah raising someone from the dead. When we come to Elisha, this is a wealthy woman, so there's a contrast with the widow, penniless wi uh, widow and a very wealthy woman from Shunem. Um, and the same thing happens. Uh, the woman, just like Sarah, uh, had been um, uh, sterile. She lives in this place, Shunem. Um, she has everything uh, she could ask for, but she doesn't have a child, just like Sarah didn't have a child. And so Elijah, uh, Elisha says, um, God, and these are similar terms to God speaking to Sarah about this time next year, you will embrace a son. She says, oh, no, don't deceive me. But the woman conceived and she bore a son, um, just as Elisha had said. So it's kind of recapitulating the Sarah story. But the problem is that little boy dies. And when the little boy dies, the woman apparently knew the Elijah story. And so she takes the little boy and puts him in the upper room um, and then goes and chides Elisha saying, why, why did you uh, do this? And so Elijah, Elisha comes and uh, lays down on the little boy two times. So Elijah lays three times, but Elisha only two. Uh, Elisha prays, and then what happens? Well, um, the little boy comes back to life. And um, uh, s same exact thing, he gives the little boy uh, back to her mother. So it's a recapitulation of the Elijah story. Elisha is working less hard, so he's performing, it looks like he's performing an easier version of the miracle, but the, the stories are connected. And as intelligent readers of the Bible, we might ask ourselves, well, why? Uh, why, why are these stories being connected? Well, it may be that there's a connection with Jesus as the super Elisha. And we hear this story. Soon afterwards, he went down to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And I hope whenever you read a story, you'll get in the habit of looking up what the names mean and where the places are. And if we do that, I'm not sure anything comes from the name, but when you look at Nain, look where Nain is right here and look what it is very near Shunem and look how close it is this is three whole miles well look at that distance Shunem and Nain are almost the exact same place this is what uh, the little place looks like it's out in the middle of nowhere um, it's at the foot of Mount Morath and this is what the text says happened. He drew near to the gate of the town, and behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Oh my goodness, this is getting details from the widow at Zarephath, uh, the penniless woman, and the wealthy woman at Shunem, because it's happening at Shunem, and the same thing is happening. They're bringing a little... Uh, dead boy out and uh, you say I know what's going to happen it's going to be interesting Jesus is going to take the little boy take him up to a room lay him down lay on him one time and pray and it's going to be very nice three two one but that's not what happens it says as he's being uh, carried out when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bear, and the bear stood still, and he said, Young man, 
I say to you, get up. Notice that Jesus doesn't pray at all. He declares, little boy, he doesn't lay on the little boy like Elijah and Elisha. He doesn't have to take him to a, an upper room. He doesn't have to lay him on a, a bed. He comes up to a dead boy and says, little boy, uh, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. That's exactly what Elijah did is exactly what Elisha did. So this text is inviting us to realize that the New Testament is presenting Jesus not just as a new Elisha, but as the super Elisha. It's interesting. It says fear sees them all, and some reasoned uh, great prophet has arisen, Elijah, Elisha, but others said, no, that's not it. God has visited his people. So you go and start reading these stories and say, does any of this have to do with Jesus? Um, are the stories related particularly when we come to this story of Elisha feeding a hundred men with 20 barley loaves. Now, before we dive into that, notice that the word Elijah means he is God or he is my God, something like that. But notice the word Elisha, that Yasha, that's the same root as Joshua. It's means Yahweh saves. Uh, my God is Yasha. My God is, uh, he saves. You wonder if there's some kind of meta narrative elegance uh, going on in the text. So we have these pairs and Jesus is being presented as the ultimate version uh, of all of it. Now, when we come to the feeding of the hundred, uh, this, these are the details. Man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits. That happens around Passover. Uh, Twenty barley loaves. Um, Elisha said, give the men that they may eat. The servant says, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give it to the men that they may eat. For thus the Lord says they will eat and have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate, and they had some left. Now, what's interesting is that in that story, it says the man has the first fruits in a sack. Deuteronomy says those should go in baskets. And when you put it in a basket, you say, uh, I testify today that the Lord our God, I have come into the land that the Lord swore to give us. That's what you do when you put it in a basket. And so when we come to the feeding of the 5,000, John says, no, it was around Passover. Well, that's exactly when the Elisha miracle happens. Uh, Jesus said, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? But he himself knew what he was going to do. Um, to, Peter says $20,000 won't be enough uh, for everybody to eat a little. And Andrew says, well, there is one boy and he has five barley loaves. But what's that for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. So the men, and notice in the uh, first... Uh, or 2 Kings 4 story, it's only men there, so they're counting. Uh, men sat down 5,000 in number. Um, they all eat. They're all satisfied. Um, and when they gather up what's left, they put it in baskets. 
it seems pretty clear that these stories are connected, that it's presenting Jesus as the new Elisha, only where Elisha took one loaf and fed five, Jesus can take one loaf and feed a thousand. Um, Elisha isn't even in the same league with Jesus. Jesus is truly, my God is Yasha, my God is salvation. Um, because the Bible is filled with this meta narrative elegance, this plot uh, symmetry where uh, Jesus is fulfilling uh, everything. That's why you have these pairs. That's why you have this one failing, this one succeeding, this one born outside, this one born inside the promised land, this one saying, repent, 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 this one enabling people to repent, this one leading people into the promised land. The Old Testament ends with the chronologically with the statement, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Um, Jesus is coming as that salvific space. Uh, it, John the Baptist is the promised Elijah. Uh, and so when you see all the problems in the story, you realize they're connected. Uh, all of those uh, begin to soften the edges. And even this decree of utter destruction, this is the word that's used elsewhere of, you know, go wipe all the Canaanites out, don't leave anything alive. And that's the last word spoken uh, chronologically in the Old Testament, uh, cherem, lest I strike the land with cherem. And Jesus comes and uh, just like the Canaanite kings in Joshua 8 and 10, he's put on a cross. He hangs there till the sun goes down. Uh, J Joshua 10, he's put in, just like the Canaanite kings, he's put in the, the, uh, the cave. A rock is put over the mouth of the cave because Jesus is saying, those who break God's law are subject to this curse. And if God left us alone, we would all be the Canaanites and be destroyed. But Jesus took that curse to himself. He hung cursed. God made him in our sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Cursed is everyone hanged on a tree. Uh, Galatians and Jesus hung on a tree because that's the solution. He uh, is perfect mercy and perfect justice uh, come together to free all those who would ever come to him by faith. Listen, I hope you have a good time discussing these things among yourself, and I look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks.